Welcome back to another edition of Beyond Addiction. My name is Adrian Webster. And up until this point in the series, we have really been focusing on the drugs, on the problem of addiction, on the neurobiology and the chemistry and the physiology and all that kind of stuff. Well, in this session, we're going to continue that, but we're going to begin to change direction and change uh, our goals uh, and our, our, our end point by beginning to focus on the key elements behind the healing process. So while we continue our journey into the chemistry behind it, we're also going to start to look at how that chemistry can help us to understand some of the elements involved with healing from substance abuse and from addiction. I've entitled this topic, Chemical Synergy, How Drugs Work Together. How Drugs Work Together. What is synergy exactly? Well, we find some great examples of synergy in nature and in lifestyle. For instance, on the negative side of life in nature, we know all too well the concept of, uh, of hurricanes and how hurricanes can be so destructive in communities. Ask the inhabitants of Florida who every year in summer get hammered by, uh, by numerous hurricanes. What is hurricane? A hurricane is a synergy of nature. We all know that wind by itself, gale force winds can be extremely destructive. We know that strong wind can tear uh, roofs off of houses. We know that strong wind can cause injury to people who are blown off their feet. We know that, that strong winds in and of itself can be very problematic. We also know that by itself, rain can be very destructive and very problematic. When it falls incessantly in large quantities over an per extended period of time, the drainage systems cannot get rid of the water fast enough and all the rest of it. We know that uh, what happens is flooding occurs. We know that when flooding occurs and the top layer of soils on, on banks and mountainsides becomes waterlogged, landslides can occur, mudslides can occur. So we know that wind by itself is dangerous. We know that rain by itself is dangerous. But when you get these two acting synergistically with one another, for instance, like in the case of a hurricane, we know that the, the, the net effects of that synergistic act activity as they come together in a team is far greater than what they would have done separately by themselves. That's the negative concept of synergy as we find it in nature. But on the positive side, when it comes to lifestyle factors and choices, we know that there is a very positive synergy that can exist between different lifestyle choices as they interact with one another. Of course, the opposite is also true negatively, that when we choose in the wrong direction in more than one of these areas synergistically, it can be very negative for us, can enhance the negative effects. But let's speak positively for a moment. And I want to spend a little bit of time here, because when I talk about healing from addiction, personally, I believe in an overall lifestyle health approach. I know that in certain circles, uh, uh, healing from addiction and overcoming addiction is really seen as a chemical reaction and therefore it's chemically treated as we try and help people get off of their drugs using other drugs and we wean them off of the first drug and then off of the second drug and so we go and we think as long as we get the person past physical withdrawal that we have solved the problem of addiction in their life. We've solved the problem of substance abuse. But addiction is a much bigger problem than just the chemical element. It has social elements and it has physiological elements, and it has all sorts of uh, even spiritual elements and so on, and we'll talk about some more of these in upcoming episodes. But when I talk about addiction and when I talk about a lifestyle of addiction, and uh, on the contrary, when I speak about healing from addiction, I believe in an overall lifestyle holistic approach. So when we look at some of these elements, when we consider, for instance, the element of nutrition, we know that we need to focus on giving the body the best and the optimal nutrition. And we'll again speak about this one in more detail in an upcoming episode. But if you're not feeding the body what it needs, it cannot have the building blocks to obtain healing. If we're not feeding the body with the right amino acids and with the right proteins and with the right all the rest of the, the elements that are involved in nutrition, with the right carbohydrates and so on, the body cannot heal itself effectively. We will delay the healing process. Uh, we need to talk about the element of exercise. Exercise 
exercise is so important when it comes to healing from addiction because exercise helps balance neurochemistry and the like. We need to talk about our water intake and how we use water. And again, more on these lifestyle subjects coming up in a future episode. We want to be cleansing the system and washing it out. We need adequate amounts of sunlight. We need to practice temperance, which is a fancy word for self-control, which is defined in my mind as abstinence from that which is harmful and moderation in that which is good because even in good things, we can overdo it. We want to focus on getting good, clean air and on getting adequate amounts of rest. And we want, to, we want to include the spiritual commitment by placing our trust in God. When you take these eight natural doctors, as I like to refer to them, you take these eight natural remedies, these eight uh, lifestyle principles, and you practice one of them or two of them, of course, there's benefit to be gained. However, when you add to the first, you add to that the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth and seventh and the eighth, and you start practicing this overall lifestyle, each of these separate elements having benefit in and of themselves, when combined into one lifestyle factor, one way of living, it creates a synergistic reaction where the, the, the net, the overall effect is greater than the sum of the individual parts. Does that make sense to you? So just like in nature, we have negative results of forces of nature coming together, each destructive by themselves, but synergistically together wreaking more havoc than ever before. So too in the positive sense when it comes to lifestyle choices, when we begin making the right decisions, positive choices, they start to impact one another and react with one another so that the overall positive effect is much greater than just the positive effects that would be reaped by each one being practiced by themselves. Friends, in a similar way that we find healing in a positive sense by including all these positive lifestyle choices, in a similar way, drugs negatively, synergistically react with one another to create greater highs while at the same time creating a greater sense of, of, uh, of, uh, of addicted uh, situation. Drug synergism is a reality, and we find it in numerous medical journals. This is not something I'm simply sucking out of my thumb. What I want to share with you is you will see the references on screen there. You can look it up for yourself that solid scientific medical research is telling us that these drugs interact with one another. Now, you already know this because when you go to the doctor and he prescribes a medication, if he knows what he's talking about, he'll ask you if you're on, on any other medications, any other supplements, because sometimes there can be a reaction between the two. Well, when it comes to creating highs, damaging the system, and thus creating greater dependency, the same principle applies. The various substances interact with one another to increase the effectiveness beyond what any individual part would have had by itself. For instance, here are some alcohol and nicotine facts taken from the Journal of Human Molecular Genetic uh, Biology and so on. And they, m notice the, they, they make a note of the following three elements when it comes to alcohol and nicotine. Did you know that 80% of alcohol-dependent individuals are smokers? 80% of alcoholics also smoke. Is that, just, is that just coincidental? Or is it because nicotine and alcohol, or also known as ethanol, interact with one another? Now, we have been going through in previous episodes how these various socially acceptable drugs work. We've spoken about caffeine, and we've spoken about tobacco, and we've spoken about alcohol. And you will remember from our study into the neurobiology that they're all activating the same neural pathways, the same reward pathway. They may have a slightly different method of doing it, but in some cases, even the method overlaps almost identically. So there's no mistake here that 80% of alco alcohol-dependent individuals are also smokers. Moreover, smokers consume twice as much alcohol as non-smokers. So if you are a smoker, you're more likely to consume more alcohol. Furthermore, alcoholism is 10 times more prevalent amongst smokers as non-smokers. Did you get that? Alcohol statistics and smoking statistics have a strong correlation here. If you are going to be uh, an alcohol-dependent alcohol individual, you're probably 80%, 8 out of 10 chance, you'll also be a smoker. If you, if you are smoking, you will consume at least twice as much alcohol as a non-smoker. And if you, uh, if you are smoking, you are 10 times more likely to become addicted to alcohol than if you were not smoking. Very interesting statistics creating a clear connection between nicotine and ethanol. 
That's why in the Journal, journal of Pharmacology and Experimental Therapies, the authors note the following, uh, or make the following statement, that combined use of tobacco and alcohol could enhance the reinforcing effect. Now, the reinforcing effect is the idea of the reward, the idea of the pleasure. Does that make sense to you? So when we combine tobacco and alcohol, it enhances the reinforcing effect in humans, as well as facilitating long-term neuroadaptations, increasing the risk for developing co-addiction. There's the word, co-addiction. What are we saying with this? That when we use, according to their research as they've studied this, when you smoke and you drink, you get a greater sense of reward. The high is enlarged. Because the high is enlarged, the brain reacts to this. It's like taking a stronger drug. So the reaction is a neuroadaptation. Now that's fancy medical terminology for basically stating that the brain adapts to these substances. It realizes there's too much dopamine, there's too much neurotransmitters going on there. And so what does it do? It counteracts the, the overreaction by withdrawing the receptors or by, or by uh, breaking down the neurotransmitter. So neuroadaptations, changes in the physical structure, changes in the function of the brain take place uh, at a greater pace, at a greater rate, when we are using both nicotine and alcohol together with one another. In the same way that the two reinforce and enlarge the high effect, the euphoria, it also damages the system at a greater rate. That's out of a medical journal. Same journal goes on to say the following, that sub-threshold doses of nicotine and ethanol activate dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens and the ventral tegmental area of the brains when applied together. Okay, whew. Okay, let's digest that in common language. In other words, sub-threshold, meaning that when you take an amount of nicotine and an amount of alcohol, which are below the amount that is needed to create an effect in the brain. Are you with us? So that amount of nicotine by itself, you won't even feel it. That amount of alcohol by itself, you will not even feel it. But when you take those two amounts, which are too little by themselves, and you administer them at the same time, what happens? All of a sudden, an effect is felt in the body. In other words, the two are enhancing one another. By themselves, they couldn't work. But together, they form a synergism that gets the system going, and reward and pleasure is the result. And where does it do it? In the nucleus accumbens and the ventral tegmental area. Now, you will remember that those are the two of the three parts in the reward pathway. Ventral tegmental area, nucleus accumbens, and the prefrontal cortex is an area of the brain in the center of the brain responsible for the sensations of reward and the sensation of pleasure. It is an area of the brain where the neurons there are storing, releasing, utilizing, reacting to a neurotransmitter called dopamine. Dopamine is the feel-good, pleasurable type of neurotransmitter, and so we end up with a system where we have activated this reward pathway, a reward pathway which would not have been activated with those individual doses of either nicotine or alcohol because they were below the threshold to create a reaction. Take them together, boom, there's a reaction inside of the brain, and you experience that as euphoria and as pleasure. The same journal goes on to say the following. Smoking is also associated with increased risk for alcoholism relapse and other substance abuse. So medically, what are they saying? They're saying that if you are struggling with the harder drugs, the cocaine and the heroin and all those things that people go into drug rehabs for, including alcohol, by the way, that people go into rehabilitation centers for, and you maintain your habit of smoking, you are disadvantaging yourself, and statistically, you're placing yourself in a much higher likelihood category for relapsing into your alcohol addiction, relapsing into your harder drug addiction. Why? Oh, we can understand the physiology from our previous episodes in Beyond Addiction. We can understand the physiology from what we're reading from these medical journals. They're activating the same pathways. That means they are utilizing and abusing the same pathways, which means they are damaging the same pathways. So I am trying to heal those pathways to get off of my hard drug while I'm constantly triggering that pathway and damaging the pathway by using a lesser stimulant or a lesser drug. But what am I doing? I'm damaging with the one hand while I'm trying to heal with the other hand. Doesn't make sense, right? That those lesser drugs form a stimulus, as it were, that creates a desire in us for a stronger type of drug 
We, we, we cultivate the desire for stimulation, while at the same time, every time we engage in that stimulation with this nicotine substance, what are we doing? We're lessening our ability to experience that stimulation. So we cultivate the desire for it, while because of the physical damage, we disenable ourselves from experiencing it. So eventually we get to a point where our smoking is not doing it for us anymore, and we are more likely to go looking for other drugs. Then when we wake up to our situation one day and we decide, I want to quit my other drugs, I find it more difficult to do so. I find myself more tempted to go back. I find myself failing more often, because as long as I'm maintaining the nicotine habit, I'm constantly dumbing down the area of the brain that's that enables me to experience pleasure, while at the same time cultivating the desire for that pleasure. Can you see how it's a, a bit of a dangerous situation in a vicious circle? So that's why they say smoking is associated with increased risk for alcoholism, relapse, and other substance abuse. If you want the best opportunity, the best uh, 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 possibility of escaping your problem of addiction, then you want to get away from all forms of substance abuse, even the nicotine abuse. abuse. Nora Falco, uh, a, a medical doctor, in an article entitled Neurobiology of Nicotine Addiction from the National Institute of Health and National Institute on Drug Abuse, has the following to say. Studies have shown that nicotine, just like cocaine, just like heroin, just like marijuana, increases the level of the neurotransmitter dopamine in the brain uh, pathways that control reward and pleasure. So she is simply confirming as a medical professional what I've outlined for you in the previous episodes and in this episode, that nicotine does the same thing in the same reward pathway as do the other drugs. We have that from a medical professional. So we're damaging those systems all the time through the use of these socially acceptable drugs. From the National Institute on Drug Abuse, we learn the following, that people who abuse alcohol often also abuse other drugs. In fact, they say 45% of patients being treated for alcohol abuse report abuse of other drugs, and alcohol and certain drugs work in the same areas of the brain. Combining drugs with alcohol can greatly intensify their effects, which can be very dangerous to the brain and the body. So I'm taking my ecstasy, or I'm taking my cocaine, or I'm doing whatever, and I'm right on the edge of what the body can tolerate. I go smoke a cigarette, or I go have a few drinks, and all of a sudden I find myself in a very dangerous position. Yes, the pleasure sensation increases, but it increases to such an extent that I may sit with an overdose problem. I may sit with, a, with an overload problem that the body simply cannot manage anymore. And of course, because of that effect, because of the enhancing effect, where they're all coming together synergistically to create a greater high than any would create by themselves, I'm also so damaging the system more rapidly and creating a worse scenario and a worse situation. So in a nutshell, to summarize what we are saying in this particular topic, number one, the various drugs have different mechanisms of action, but the same net effect. Whether they do it through option one we learned about in a previous episode where, where we overstimulate dopamine release or whether we do it through option two by, by uh, stopping the recycling process or, or whether we do it by reacting directly with the dopamine receptors or whether we do it like with, with nicotine by reacting with the acetylcholine receptors or, or whatever the particular channel is. The, 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 the direction or the method may be slightly different but the net effect is identical. Secondly, all drugs ultimately use and abuse the dopamine system. They may be utilizing other systems, serotonin system, endorphin system. They may be utilizing the acetylcholine system as well. But the common denominator in all of them is they all use and abuse, stimulate or block the reuptake of the dopamine in the synapses of the reward pathway. So they're acting in the same area as well as other individual areas, and they are accomplishing the same goal, goal together. Thirdly, combining different drugs results in increased reward and therefore also increased damage of that system. And when we cocktail drugs, this leads to substance co-dependency. So I can't just drink or I can't just smoke. I have to do them together. I can't just do my cocaine. But when I'm high on my cocaine, I also need to smoke a cigarette because it whew, sends me through the roof. I have to do all these drugs in combination because I find a greater high. Greater damage, of course, as well. So what are we saying with all of this? Obviously, it tells us something about how we can find healing. If we know that these drugs synergistically act with one another, then obviously a step toward healing will mean that we will give up 
all substances together. When you come in for treatment or you go in for treatment to a lifestyle center, for, to a rehab clinic or whatever it is, even if they do not insist on you giving up your cigarettes, you giving up your caffeine because those are socially acceptable, you should make an intelligent choice yourself to give it all up. Because otherwise, as I said before, you'll be trying to heal with one hand while you're trying to destroy with the other hand. And those two actions do not go together. This is one of the biggest problems I think we have in conventional therapy, in conventional treatment for drug abuse, uh, in the conventional medical world, is we see addiction as a particular substance. We see addiction as cocaine addiction or as heroin addiction. And our, our objective as a medical professional, our objective as a detox professional is to say, hey, I need to get this person off of the substance. They get off of their cocaine, they get off of their heroin, they leave their free of that particular substance. We pat ourselves on the back and we go, well done, Adrian. You are a good medical professional, you are a good nursing assistant, you are a good addiction expert, you help them get off of their cocaine, you help them get off of their heroin. Now make no mistake, that is good news and it is a step in the right direction because those drugs will kill you real quick. So you've bought them some time, but you haven't necessarily solved the problem of addiction because addiction is much bigger than a particular substance. Addiction is bigger than Heroin. Addiction is bigger than cocaine. I may get a person off of those two substances or any one of the others while I am perpetuating their addictive behavior in some other area of their life. So I have not solved the problem of addiction. I've only solved the problem of cocaine. As I say, a step in the right direction, but perhaps we need a new way of thinking of these substances so that we realize that it is not about a substance. It's about a package called addiction. And I haven't solved the package of addiction until I have helped the person be move beyond all their substances. And that's why addiction problem or the, the, the solving of addiction goes beyond physiology, goes beyond chemical uh, chemical fixing of the problem through weaning a person off of one drug by giving them another drug, etc. It's a lifestyle approach. It's about healing the whole human organism. Does that make sense to you? We are trying to deal with the problem of addiction, which is bigger than, a, than, than one, one substance within that problem of addiction. So we want to be sure, friends, that we have this bigger picture as we take a step toward healing, understanding that drug synergism is a reality. When you go into the conventional treatments, they, they, they say, you know what, uh, it's okay, you can smoke as much, as much as you want, you can drink as much coffee as you want. So they come out free of their cocaine, free of their, their heroin, but they're a chain coffee drinker or they are a chain smoker. For the time they're in the treatment rehab center, they're not allowed to drink, obviously. Alcohol is regarded as one of those drugs which, which are not tolerated in these sort of settings. But when they go home, it doesn't matter. You can have your red wine. You can have your shot of tequila once in a while, your beers or whatever. And if you understand drug synergism, you'll realize that doesn't make sense. I'm setting myself up for failure. I'm setting myself up for a situation where I'm constantly triggering the reminder and I'm constantly damaging that system and I'm cultivating the desire for a stronger stimulus and so eventually I end up relapsing. The medical journals are telling us that if we want the best opportunity possible of overcoming addiction as a whole, then we need to set aside all of these substances when we're trying to break free. And if we want to stay free, stay free of all the substances. So if you need to go somewhere for help, quit it all at the same time. Why prolong the pain and say, I'll get off this one today and off of another one tomorrow and off of another one next week? Why not get rid of the problem at once and allow the brain the greatest opportunity, maximum potential for healing the reward pathway and getting you back to the point where you can enjoy life without these substances at all? The bottom line, friend, is really quite simple. As it says in John 8, verse 36, If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. God offers you the opportunity to be free and to be free 100%. He's not interested in just offering you 50% of freedom, 95% of freedom, either 99.9% .9 of freedom. He is the definition of freedom and he came to restore our freedom to us. We may have given it away voluntarily. We may have handed it over into this giant tyrant of addiction's hands and he has taken it and we think we will never get it back. But the Lord is able to open up his fist, take 
take our freedom back and give it back to us as a gift. If the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. He will give you the ability to overcome all substances, no matter how far you have fallen. I leave you with this message of hope, that it is never too late to turn your life and your mind over into the hands of God. Let Him give you the freedom which you have not been able to find for yourself. Let Him break the power of all these substances and realize that you can cooperate with Him by breaking free of all substances and not trying to retain a little bit of addiction, a socially acceptable drug here and there, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Give it all to Him and let Him give you total and complete victory, absolute and complete abstinence from that which is harmful. It is not worth it, friends. We set ourselves up for failure. We lessen our chances of long-term success when we maintain in our lifestyle any form of addiction, any substance, even the socially acceptable ones, because they all work in the same way in the brain. They all damage it and they all break it down. We want to give our minds and our hearts to God, and I encourage you to make that spiritual commitment even today that you may know the joy of freedom and deliverance. Allow me to share a word of prayer with you. Heavenly Father, will you bless the viewer? Will you open their mind that they may understand these things? Will you give them the desire to be free from all forms of addiction, not just to be focused on alcohol or cocaine or heroin or ecstasy or a particular substance. May we seek the life that is truly free. May we seek the life that is abundant. And may you give us that experience. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.